For as long as I can remember, Toyota has been synonymous with reliability. But let's be honest, that hasn't so much been the case recently. Things like the new Tundra and Tacoma have had engine and transmission problems, resulting in a ton of recalls. This, though, is the 2024 RAV4, and what's important about it is it's the last year it will have the old tried-and-true powertrain. So the question is, does it make sense to spend a bunch of money on a new vehicle with old technology? That's what we're going to find out today by taking a look outside, inside, and I'm going to show you some of the features on the interior. Of course, we're going to take a look at the engine and transmission powering this vehicle. We're going to try and throw a bike in the back to see how usable it is. And last but not least, we're going to take it out on the road to see what it's like to drive. Is there much to be said about the looks of a RAV4? I mean, this generation has been around for so long now, and you see a million of them on the road. You either like or hate the way this thing looks. It's just ubiquitous at this point. This though is the TRD Off-Road Edition. So it does have some different looks, starting with some knobbier tires on black wheels. Of course, as well, this is the army green color. And if I could say something briefly about green, I think it is an underrepresented color in the automotive landscape. I think this car looks great with this color specifically, but let me know what you think in the comments below about the looks of this generation RAV4. Here is that tried and true powertrain I was referencing before. This is a 2.5 liter naturally aspirated engine, meaning not turbocharged, paired with an eight speed transmission, meaning not a CVT transmission. The beauty part about this setup is its simplicity. It has been around for a while and it is going to go for just such a long time. There's not a lot to go wrong here. Now, with old technology, of course, you're gonna be making some sacrifices. You have the most in reliability here, but in terms of fuel economy and power, it's a little down compared to some of the new tech. Things like the horsepower, 203 horsepower, 184 pound-feet of torque, although it doesn't quite feel like that up here at 6,000 feet of elevation. And then, of course, the fuel economy. 25 city, 32 highway isn't the worst, but there are a lot more vehicles getting better fuel economy than that these days. Now we talked about how the powertrain is that old tried and true technology, but this car does get some new tech and particularly here on the interior, it really all revolves around this infotainment. You do have a modern screen with good resolution. It has Toyota's and latest and greatest in their infotainment structure so it's very easy to navigate a uh, very simple menu structure it also has wireless android auto and apple carplay so that's something that kind of makes this feel a little more modern the rest of it though does feel a little bit dated but it's not all bad don't get me wrong so for example as i always talk about physical hvac controls nice to have a knob and or button to be able to modify how hot or cold it is in here. Um, same thing with your heat and cool seats. It's just a physical button. You don't go digging through a menu structure within the infotainment to do that. Same thing here with the gear select. It's just a lever, traditional lever. It's not some stupid button thing that Honda is doing now, which I don't frankly understand. Uh, same thing with the gauge cluster. It is at least partially traditional. You have some physical dials, but you do have a screen in the center. That screen does look a bit dated though. The resolution is a little bit poor, frankly, on that. What's to be said about the rest of this? Well, the highlight really is the fact that even though this has been around for a while, it's extremely usable. We talked about the HVAC, but also the visibility is excellent in here. There's a ton of room in here as well, especially headroom for me at 6'1". Uh, the only place this really falls short and it's like really due for a refresh is when you get out of a new CRV, which has been updated, and get into one of these, it feels just a half step down in build quality. It's just not quite as solid as the Hondas of the world. The materials themselves even feel just a half step down compared to those cars. So I will be curious to see what this car feels like next year when they are doing a uh, full redesign of it. Last thing, of course, that we always talk about are the seats. I really like these front seats. They are relatively supportive. They're a soft-ish leather at material. They're of course heated and cooled. And what I like about them is that they're quite adjustable all the way down to the lumbar support. So if you have a bad back like me, you're gonna really like that. Of course, the back seats are also a highlight 
because even though this is a relatively small SUV by today's standards, there is a ton of room back there, both for legroom and headroom. Once again, I'm 6'1". I fit back there great, no problems at all. So you can fit four adults in here without any problems. Before we go on a drive, I think it's worth throwing a bike in the back to see how usable that hatchback is. Before we hop into the bike test, one thing I will say is just how easy putting the rear seats down is in the RAV4. Some vehicles, the rear seat headrest hits the front seat and you have to move the front seat forward in order to get that rear seat down. That's not so in the RAV4. Now, just like we saw in the RAV4 Prime, bike loading is impressive with this car especially compared to the CRV. The CRV is dimensionally larger, however, the RAV4 has a bigger rear opening for that hatch, which allows me to fit my extra large frame mountain bike without issues. As always, if you enjoy the bike test, make sure you're hitting that subscribe button and leaving a comment below so you don't miss future videos. going for a ride in the RAV4. What we're gonna do here is Tarantino this. We're gonna start with the ending, start with the conclusion, and then we're gonna work backwards and, and figure out how we got there. Okay, so the conclusion to this video is, I think the RAV4 is a good product, but this trim doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and I don't know why you'd pick it. Okay, so that's the conclusion. There's a lot more to it as to why, so let's work backwards. What is the TRD off-road? Well, it's their attempt at making these, this the most capable RAV4 that is sold. And in order to do that, they wanted to have a more traditional transmission in this vehicle, and they also wanted a little more of a traditional drivetrain in this vehicle in terms of off-road. So why is that important? Why am I saying all this? Because the hybrid, every hybrid RAV4, even if it is all-wheel drive, is sort of e-all-wheel drive. It only, the front engine, the actual gas engine, only drives the front wheels in those cars. There is just happens to be an electric motor in the rear that will also help out the rear wheels when you lose traction. Now that's a pretty slick system because you know they're not tied together and it's very easy to package. You don't have to put a drive shaft in the middle. So that's like somewhat slick, but it's not very good for off-road or even like severe weather conditions because there's only so much power you can put back in that electric motor. Once again, that's the hybrid version of this car. The reason that they have the base motor in this thing, this 2.5 liter engine, is because it's the only powertrain that they can pair that has a physical drive shaft to the rear end. So it's gonna get you more traction back there. So that's a whole long roundabout way of saying they have the base engine and powertrain in this vehicle, but this is a $40,000 RAV4. It's, it's like pretty expensive in terms of RAV4s. So my question is why? Like who is going on extreme off-roading enough that you need this level of capability. Because the, the, the thing that I'm getting at here is that like, yes, the regular hybrid has an electric motor in the back and only drives the front wheels, but it does just fine like in light off-road situations. And I think that's, let's be realistic, 99.9% .9 of RAV4 owners, that's all they're ever gonna do. They're gonna drive mostly on the road and then they may go on a dirt road when they're trying to go on a hike or, you know, trying to go sightseeing or something like that. And that standard CVT transmission and e-electric all-wheel drive drivetrain is gonna be frankly just fine for that. So yes, you get an eight-speed transmission, more traditional in this thing, you can tow a little more, but I, I just don't see who is actually going to use that. So getting back to the TRD off-road that we're in, but the other thing that you get with the off-road is skid plates. Okay, great. Once again, who is doing that hard, hardcore of off-roading that you need skid plates? Uh, you also get a TRD tuned suspension. So you may say, oh, well, maybe that's worth it, right? Maybe it's lifted. Maybe it has more ground clearance than a standard car. No, it has the same amount of ground clearance as even the base model RAV4, 8.4 inches of ground clearance. So it's not lifted in any way. 
And while it is slightly revised, you get slightly retuned shocks. I just drove that RAV4 Prime not too long ago, and I can't tell the difference. Like, I'm, I'm pretty tuned in with cars and suspensions. I've driven a lot of them, and I really can't tell much of a difference. Like, not enough for it to, like, really make sense to opt for paying extra money for it. Here's the kicker with all this. You know, this is all the stuff that you get in TRD off-road. There is a trim level called the Woodlands. And let me describe the Woodlands to you. You get the TRD off-road suspension that this car has. You also get the off-road tires, just like this one has. They're all-terrain tires. You also get the hybrid engine. So you get the more superior, in many ways, powertrain with that car, or at least engine. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, powertrain. So. Why would you not go with that? Oh, and here's the kicker with the Woodlands. It's $4,000 cheaper than this vehicle. Why would you not go with that? The, the sort of catch is that with the Woodlands trim, you get the base cloth seats. So you have to decide what is important to you. Can you live with base cloth seats? If you can, I would highly recommend that model over this one. Uh, just because, once again, you're getting the better powertrain. It has more horsepower. It gets better fuel economy, especially up here at elevation. Those electric motors really help because this thing struggles to go up I-70. Uh, I'm in Colorado. I-70 is the highway that goes up into the mountains. And man, this thing, when you put your foot to the floor, it really struggles to get up to speed. You, it would really benefit from having that hybrid powertrain with a little bit of that electric battery boost and electric motor boost behind it. Because otherwise, you know, these are all essentially the same car. They are very usable from a day-to-day -day standpoint. We already covered the interior. There's a lot of space. They have a fair amount of road noise and wind noise, certainly compared to something like a CRV. And I think that's really the biggest competition for this vehicle, of course, is the CRV. And if you are doing more off-roading, the CRV in many ways is going to be probably more capable because that by default has the actual preferred drivetrain like this has, where it has a physical prop shaft in the center and is driving the rear, rear wheels. So in every all wheel drive model, it has that. This is the problem with this car foot to the floor. Now I'm going the speed limit. I mean, that was like downhill to get on the highway. Uh, now we have to slow down for this semi and then get over. Oof, not a particularly uh, inspiring noise, is it? So once again, I, I, I think that this car overall is a really good product. The RAV4, there's a reason they sell close to a million of these a year. And ultimately, that's also why they have so many different trims to choose from. But for me, I'm going with just a base hybrid version or maybe the Woodlands if I want some off-road capability. Because ultimately, they all get the same amount of ground clearance. I don't think, frankly, the skid plates are going to be all that helpful to the type of off-roading that somebody in a RAV4 is going to do. And it will save you money. At $40,000, it's a lot of money for a RAV4. So... Those are my thoughts. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, if you did make it this far, thank you very much. But uh, RAV4, once again, great car. Probably not the best trip. See you guys.